welcome to episode three of the Planning Period Podcast. In this episode, I talked to a good friend of mine, Michael Coleman, and he'll introduce himself here in a second. But we talk about a lot of different things, but we specifically focus a lot on technology and how technology is integrated into classrooms, specifically in our district, but also how we would like to see technology integrated and some things we see coming in the future. A lot of circling around technology for this one. I want to take a second to go ahead and thank you all for your support of the Planning Period podcast. I loved seeing all the tweets the shares and people just pushing the word out there. It really means a lot to me that you guys are getting something out of this and enjoying it. And that's really why I'm doing this is to try to to help other people. So I really appreciate that. If you'd like to help support the Planning Period podcast, the best thing you can do is go on iTunes and review us and say, hey, this is super cool. I like it. I learned whatever. Doesn't really matter. Or say you hate it. Go tell me you hate it. Whatever. Just review it. Let us know. Let me know what you think. I really appreciate it. Um, But also beyond that, go ahead and share it. Tell your friends, tell them that this podcast is out there and it might be something they're interested in. I hope that people find value in what we're doing and what I'm doing with interviewing people here. So I'd really appreciate that. Now sit back and enjoy my interview with Michael Coleman. All right. So welcome to the Planning Period Podcast. I am your host, Brad Schreffler, uh, CRT slash digital instructional coach in Central Florida. Joined today by a good friend of mine, Michael Coleman, who is a uh, fellow teacher of mine in a couple different places, but I'll let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Michael Coleman, and I teach also in the Central Florida area, uh, primarily uh, to advanced placement students, but I do have a range of students as well. Okay. And what subject area? And uh, right now I'm in the geographic sciences. Geographic sciences. You have such like a fancy way of saying <laughs> <Yes>. that. Yes. <laughs> there are many names for this course that many, I'm teaching. <laughs> many names. I prefer geographic sciences. In addition to that, Mike and I actually teach together with our alternative certification program here in our county for anyone who has a degree in something besides education and is now teaching and needs to get that sort of certification knocked out so they can continue teaching long term. So we teach that together as well. It's our second full-time job. (laughs) Yes, our second full... Like most teachers, you cannot survive (laughs) on our income alone and must find additional work. Exactly. We're lucky enough that our additional work is in the same place, which is kind of nice. And you and I have been doing that for what? This is our, what, third year together doing this? I believe this is our third year now. Nice. Very cool. Even though you constantly say you're going to leave me. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get started. I will start with uh, my first question, which in this case... My question is, what do you see as the biggest problem in education right now? Well, one of the biggest problems, I guess if I had to choose a single issue right now, it would be technology adoption. And the issue that I'm currently seeing is this push to try and bring on a lot of new platforms that don't necessarily communicate with one another. So whether it be an LMS that doesn't talk with the gradebook or a gradebook that doesn't have any way to communicate beyond a simple um, comment box field. Um, I feel like we need a platform that gives tighter integration. I'd like to see something that's open source, preferably, um, so that it uh, will not expire when the funding expires. That's my a very real concern that I think a lot of us in education have. There are a lot of things that we'd like to adopt, but there are concerns of what happens when the money runs out, and I don't want to develop for a platform just to see that go to waste. Wow, you've hit a lot of things. we got a lot of things <laughs> to talk right. about. First of all, th- thanks for calling. You know, I don't do any pre-interview on these things. I, I gave Mike about 30 minutes worth of warning of what his questions were. Um, and that was and a very well-thought-out response, by the way. And then giving, I had to go teach a class. Yeah, and then you immediately had to go teach a <laughs> which class. Which gave you no time to reflect <laughs> exactly. on. Exactly. So, uh, so very well-thought-out response. Uh, however, so let's start with the, the technology component. You know, you talked about integration and and platforms. Can you... Maybe from your experience, what has that looked like? So from my my personal experience, our school has adopted technology platforms just in this current school year. And so we've gone, we've transitioned within this one year from very limited technology to complete one-to-one. All students have um, an HP convertible computer with touchscreen and Along with that, of course, was the adoption of some basic platforms in order to communicate with those students. And at the beginning of the year, we were given a couple of options. The initial option was Edmodo, which is a platform that's been used throughout our county for a few years now. And a newer option being Google Classroom, which a lot of teachers really jumped on this year, in part because of the simplicity that it entails 
And for a lot of our teachers, since they were new and getting started with it anyways, they were looking at uh, simplicity as a really key factor in that entry-level adoption of technology. Um, But those have been our two primary platforms. Well, and you know, in my experience, we not only had the Google Adoption in my school was a year ahead of your school, and we also spent a year on Microsoft 365. So we went Microsoft 365 (laughs) to Google to um, and, and we both know going forward that we're actually going to be finally um, offered a full feature LMS next year, which I don't know how you feel about it. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but I, I like that we're switching to something. But there's the obvious con that is the same problem we've run into, and that's that we're throwing another platform yeah. at our staff. And I, I can't even imagine in in your position with your school and your faculty to have three consecutive years with three platform shifts has got to be beyond frustrating, especially for the non-technology centric educators who really, for them to learn and master the ins and outs of that platform really required a great amount of effort. And the faith that they have that we will hang on to any new platform, (laughs) I'm sure has been hampered by this as well. It certainly has. I will say that in our trainings for for our new LMS, there was reiteration multiple times about contract lengths and you will have this for a long (laughs) time, Uh, which is great. Except again, I feel like, you know, we've been burned so many times. I question if that's true or not. Yeah, I mean, if, if all goes well, I think we're looking at, is it five years is what I understand that was what of I was Canvas told adoption. Five years. But and like I, you said, there's that funding issue. Yes. And, you know, at the end of the five years, uh, you know, what happens? And, and you know, I also get it from the other perspective. How many years do you want to lock yourself into something? Because five years in the world of technology is a lifetime. And, you know, what's amazing today, a new platform can come along tomorrow that just blows it out of the water. So, you know, how do you find that right balance between maintaining a platform and allowing people to thrive in it versus locking yourself into an extended contract in a platform that may stagnate over time. And it's a big, it is a big issue. I want to believe our district is headed in the right direction now. And I emphasis want to believe um, (laughs) that we're headed in the right direction now in that we are a five-year contract. I feel like is a pretty good length. I feel like that's a safe length. I mean, like you said, my school switching three times in three years, that's unacceptable. It's not acceptable. and it's not yeah. that cut and dry because we'll still use a Google suite to create documents and then switch them on to Canvas. I mean, it's it's all over the place, but still it is mentally and more and like for the morale goes for my staff, it is definitely three platforms, three years. Absolutely. And how do we, every time we get comfortable with one thing, now we change it to something else. Now, in terms of total transparency, of course... We should also point out that your school was an early adopter. And so we were part of a pilot program. So that was part as part of this piloting, there was this possibility um, that platforms could change and that competing platforms could be chosen. Maybe that maybe that (laughs) was not. I don't know if that that was emphasized fairly enough or clearly enough to our staff. (laughs) I think we just kept telling them, no, ours is the best. They'll use ours. Don't worry about it. (laughs) So that did not work as well as we had hoped. What do you think the role and because I guess this kind of connects to it for me, what do you think the role of either the school administration or the district role should be in helping facilitate those or helping fix that problem, address that problem? Well, I feel like having district buy-in is essential because ultimately they're going to determine the funding for a lot of these platforms and even a free platform, which, you know, I was a long-term Moodle user, Moodle being an open platform uh, for development. That was, you know, there was a, a big push towards that not only being open, but also being um, less expensive than some other options that were available at the time. But what our district found out was that the costs involved in maintaining our own servers and troubleshooting problems within the district, that proved to be a great challenge as well. And I think that was a big push towards the platform adoption of Canvas was to contract out a lot of that work. We no longer have to host everything in-house. We can still have things securely maintained and multiple backups off-site, which is fantastic because that was another issue. I, I only ever had it happen once, but I can tell you when you've spent years building a site in an LMS platform and one day you go to log in and it says, you know, user authentication failure or no content found, um, it brings tears to your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so. so another thing you touched on was you, you keep using this word development. And, it, and in my head, and I'm sure for you and somewhat as well, like as a tech-centric person, I think of development as actually going in and writing code a lot of times. But there's a humongous development investment in terms of a teacher perspective 
you launch a new platform and it's not like you can click one button and everything from Enmodo dumps to Google Classroom and everything in Google Classroom dumps from Canvas. There's a huge time investment there. So not only are we having to teach our staffs how to use the tools, but then they have to go actually use them for hours upon hours to build new quizzes and build new tests and build new things. So that's huge. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think for a lot of our teachers, they're looking for some open platforms that they can integrate with an LMS. So one example of that would be that in place of using some of the built-in features of some of these platforms, they're using um, some open platforms, like for example, uh, as opposed to maybe creating a quiz within Canvas, they're creating a quiz using Google Forms, which whether or not we transition to another platform in the future, they can always make a backup copy of that particular quiz and use that assessment data. Now, there are some flaws and downsides to that as well, and it's that it can negate the whole point of the LMS, which was to bring all of these components in-house and kind of utilize the built-in gradebook systems. So now as a lead technology educator, I have to try and explain the pros and cons of this in a way that helps teachers to understand that when you when you don't go all in on a platform, when you pick little pieces of it and you try and mix in with some other things, there are some potential downsides that they just need to be aware of. And yeah, I think... It's a great, a great point about awareness. You know, getting that, getting that awareness to the staff is really, and, and I know you do a lot of that. Even in your role, you're still, you know, you didn't mention this, but you're also a coach in the sense of digital at your school. You know, you're you're a digital forward leader, and so you you do that, and and that's obviously what I do the majority of my day. And that awareness is one of the biggest challenges I face, and I don't know if that's similar for you. It is. I'm sure, you know, at a very different level, I would imagine, as I I spend the majority of my time, um, you know, in a traditional classroom environment, but just fielding phone calls and emails throughout the day about anything related to either platforms or digital tools or really any number of things that we've either either things that we've adopted or just things that people want to know about. Um, Yeah, it can become a little overwhelming and giving teachers the right mentality of how and when to use these tools um, and which tool is best for which particular uh, which particular things they're trying to do with their students can be challenging. Where do you want us to go? I mean, you mentioned open platform on an LMS, but just maybe bigger picture or smaller picture, where do you want us to go? So, you know, as we've mentioned, there's now officially been an adoption, which I think is a good first step towards this. Now, uh, what I'd like to see is a higher level of support for this new platform adoption. I'd like to see a, a push um, to get student, uh, excuse me, teachers trained in this platform. And I know that currently, at least um, you know, within our, our schools, there are some opportunities. They are giving some paid opportunities, which I think is fantastic because I think expecting individuals to come in over the summer and non-paid to learn a platform that has now been changed multiple times, Um, you know, people become disheartened by that. So I think they made the right move in offering some incentives to get teachers on track with it. Yeah, I will say that is one thing our district has done well. Um, My staff is now for the third summer in a row going to have paid training (laughs) opportunities available because of changing platforms over and over over again. They keep getting (laughs) trained in the summer, so extra pay for us. Yay. Yeah, Um, you know, and we're talking about the downsides of switching to multiple platforms, of course, there's the upside to it, which is, you know, your teachers in particular, they know how to integrate Microsoft tools. They know how to integrate Google tools. They'll know how to utilize a true LMS platform a la Canvas or, uh, you know, Blackboard or any other, you know, major um, platform like that. So it's going to give them a skill set that not everybody has just because of the exposure to a lot of these tools. So you might have a teacher who really liked making Microsoft Sway in their classroom and they find a cool way to adopt it into their classroom and to integrate it with, say, Canvas or a teacher who really had a creative way to create quizzes in um, Google Forms and they can pull some of those existing forms in. Yeah, I think you're right. And you know, I, I had some people visiting my school today that are going to be in the next cohort. They're going to go one-to-one next year. And one of the things they kept kind of asking is like, well, what do you do with teachers having problems with this? Or what do you do if the internet's out? A lot of it was about problems. Like, what do you do when mm-hmm. something goes wrong? And I eventually kind of said, I go, you know, one of the things that's happening here is our staff has to be flexible and they have to just solve the problem. You, ha- you have to just deal. 
because problems occur. And I think it's same thing to your point is they're learning a skill set in terms of understanding the implications and understanding how this affects instruction, not necessarily just the technology component. It's gone, we've had to go because of changes in platform and everything else so far above the, well, you're teaching, so now create a form. You know, you're teaching, you're, you're quizzing, so do this. You're do, I don't point direct to, to a tool. It's so much of my, so much of my PD and training is about instructional strategies shifting and then worrying about the tool to get to that instructional strategy. And I think that maybe that is where I see the vision long term is we need to get less focused on the technology itself. The technology should be the given. It's the vehicle. We really need to be focusing on the destination. And that takes time. You know, it's a shift that has to happen over time because until you know how to drive the car, you can't think about where you're driving to. I agree completely, um, especially with this concept of um, how there is such a push to, you know, like, well, what is what do you have to do this? And, you know, I'm like, well, what it, what have you always used? What have you done in the past? Because a lot of the things that teachers are currently doing can be adapted with very little modification into many of these platforms. If they traditionally had done that activity as a discussion in their class, well, they can, you know, type those responses in to the message board here. And it's, you know, they're accomplishing a similar type of objective. So, you know, it's just it's not about always like going out and finding a new tool. It's let's look at what we what we're currently using and how that can be adapted. Cool. Yeah, I like that. And it's it's that it's also that twenty first century skill of it's not you know it's it's figuring out the problem for yourself too. So it, it kind of hits both of those things. Let's um you know the last thing you talked about is open source, and this is something that's come up a couple of times with me. Not even just in technology, but just sort of in education in general. There was a there was an article actually this week that a lot of colleges are starting to go to open source textbooks to save money for their students. And a lot of, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some talk. I, I was actually on a podcast a couple weeks ago regarding uh, one of the EdChat podcasts about talking about open source textbooks in, in, in schools. So you mentioned open source, just curious, and I did not prepare you at all for this. So we're just going <laughs> to no, totally run with it. Any thoughts on open source curriculum, sort of elimination of a standard textbook? So here's the thing. I love the idea behind an open source curriculum. Um, it's not without its flaws because when you have individuals who are publishing material that may or may not have been vetted by any particular editing process, um, it does increase the potential to spread misinformation. Um, you, know, you might find an excellent resource and everything looks legitimate, but that nobody was paying for that content, so nobody fact-checked the content, which means that, you know, it could be questionable. And that's a concern. It's definitely something to be concerned about. However, when you look at the accuracy statistics of sites like Wikipedia, for example, um, which through many referenced tests has actually been shown to be as accurate as many of the other, you know, paid platforms, Britannica and others, Whenever you rely on a large enough community and you have enough people involved that are part of the process and you have curators that are a part of that platform, even if they're publishing free content, I feel like it has some great potential behind it. Yeah, and I think it's so cool. I, they were using the example of just like government, for example, which is I know dear, you know, near and dear to you, but you know, no textbook you have has the current president in it. And maybe that's so there's there's two arguments there. And that's that maybe that's not the important content anyways. The important content is understanding how presidents become about and what they do as a role and not necessarily who the specific president is. But at the same time, that current relevance could be important to a student. And I I agree wholeheartedly with the underlying basis of that, that like especially in government, I taught government um, for many years and that class was always about teaching the platforms and the techniques and the systems rather than like the day-by-day current events. However, with an open source platform, that is a benefit that you can integrate. You can take the educational component of it and utilize current, you know, more current event type oriented items. And I will say that at least in social sciences, the benefit to this is that the students see the reality of this unfolding around them. So it's definitely... You know, it, it gives them something that they can look out their window, and that makes a big difference. We always talk about real-world connections in the classroom, and I feel like in that particular um, area in particular, it, it's nice to be able to make those connections. Cool. All right. Let's kind of move to my second question here, I, my next question for you. What is one thing 
that you feel every teacher should be doing? Maybe something you're great at, maybe something you're, you know, you're learning as well, but something you feel like every teacher should be doing that they're maybe not doing. I'm trying to avoid another technology. Oh, feel free. We can, we can make it a technology episode. That's fine. I, I know, and I, I feel bad to keep going back to that concept. I guess for me, it would just be to continue to try new things. And right now, so much of that is focused in the realm of technology. However, I will point out that some of the best strategies that I've used involve um, things like Kagan cooperative learning structures. And those are done in most cases with the absence of technology. And I've, I've had many students say to me after activities that, you know, like, oh, that was a really great activity. I learned so much today. And I don't know that I've had that type of enthusiasm after, you know, completing a Google form quiz or, <laughs> you know, having the students post, you know, make a post in Edmodo. Like, so the interactivity among students, I think, is a big is a big deal. Um, continually trying um, not only new technology platforms and new services to see how you can integrate them, but um, especially looking at non-technology based activities that require the students to really have that dialogue with one another. It's, it's an important skill that I'm concerned that we are not, um, we're not really doing good, a good enough job in teaching this skill to students today. Why do you think teachers are hesitant to, to try new things? It's time consuming, and I think that's a big factor. When I have spoken to many colleagues about why they haven't adopted certain platforms or I'll see that they're not using something, and I did an in-service, and I'm like, this was so great. How are you not using this? I have to take a step back and remember that, you know, I, I've chosen to make that a focus of, of how I teach, and they have their own things that they're uh, that they're currently working through trying to prepare their students for. And that might be very low down on the list. So even though I'm enthusiastic about it, and I'm hoping that my enthusiasm translates into people adopting things, I have to understand the realities of it. And time always seems to be one of those factors that people keep coming back to. They say, well, if I had more time, I would you know, try and do that. Or I would love to start using this or to transition to this. But I don't have the time to recreate. I don't have the time to, you know, make a new version of this. And and I get that. It's it's an issue that all teachers have. As a as your limited role as support, how how do you overcome that barrier? You know, assuming there's another one that's another coach or someone else listening to this, what is one of the ways you overcome that barrier with your staff? Well, we do try to provide several opportunities throughout the week for teachers to meet. We realize that planning periods, while when they are available, are a fantastic opportunity. A lot of teachers use their planning periods for content in their classroom. You know, they they needed that time to grade the test that they had, you know, recently given or to, you know, finish creating the assignment that they're going to give, you know, next week. So being flexible with the times that the trainings have offered has been a big deal. We've also... Um, created um, Google Classroom group where uh, instead of bombarding teachers with email on a constant basis of try this, try this, try this, it's a place for us to post items and then we simply encourage them on occasion to check out some of the new topics. Um, so we're not inundating them with information that's that's getting lost. It's a repository of sorts of here are some really cool new things in this area and when you get a chance, you should definitely check it out. And that's where those, you know, like a weekly email might come out where just once a week we send something out like, you know, here's a list of some of the things that, you know, have been added recently. If you're interested in this or this, please check out, you know, these items. And that's definitely, I would say that our staff has reacted very well to that. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's a practice I, I, I do as well. Um, with my staff, I do a weekly Tech Tuesday email that is sort of a one little tip once a week to be, this is what we're doing. And this is what, maybe you should try this or maybe, and I try to avoid that. Maybe you should try this stuff, right? Like yes. I, I try to do more like, this is something you're probably already using. So here's a new way to do it, or here's something to add to it or something like that. I try to limit that. But yeah, that I think that, I think probably in my opinion, once a week is about the limit of what people want to be given. They may choose to get more, but they are going to be given about once a week, and that's about the max of what they can handle. 
So I think that's that's a great practice. I agree with that completely. Let's talk about a third thing. We may loop back, talk about some other stuff again, but okay. let me go to my third question because I love this question. <laughs> the Who is your favorite teacher you ever had or who is the teacher that had the biggest impact on you? So <laughs> when we were starting the session or prior to starting the session, rather, you kind of, I asked you, you know, what kind of things are we going to talk about? And you mentioned this as one of the topics and I legitimately did try and give this some thought. And while I do have memories of a handful of teachers, I can't really say, like, I wish that I had had that amazing teacher that was so unbelievably talented and gifted and just, you know, thoughtful and generous and life changing that I could just throw a name at you and say this person because of this, this and this. And I just don't have it. Um, I, I know a lot of my peers do, and that's what's inspired many of them to become educators, you know, was another, you know, there was a teacher at some point and they said, I want to be like that particular person. And I don't want that to be mistaken as that, you know, I never had any quality educators. I most certainly did. Um, I just can't say that I had anybody that really um, reached out to me in that profound of a way. And that's in no way saying that I feel like I play that role. Um, I would love to be that for somebody. I can't necessarily say that that's the case. Um, I'll get an occasional student who will come back and say, oh, I really liked your class. And I know, I'm, you know, like as a teacher, there are very few things that can be as impactful as, you know, having somebody come back and pay you a visit years later. And you see, you know, now they're graduating from college and they took the time when they visited the school to come back and see your classroom. Um, I mean, I know that to be that kind of a teacher takes a level of dedication to the craft that is beyond, you know, the, the norm. Um, so tell me, you how did you how did you end up in education if you didn't have? <laughs> and I mean, like, I don't know. I feel like you're right. Pretty much anyone I've asked this, they have. I, I was actually at a conference, and I've mentioned this in other episodes, but I'll say it anyways. I was at a conference, and, and Chris and I and Uzi made a comment as she was presenting as a keynote speaker at a conference, and she said. Ask anybody who their favorite teacher is, and they'll tell you a story. I, you're the <laughs> yeah, first the person first to break that one. rule for me. I don't. How did I you end up on breaker. this path? Um, so, I've asked myself that question many times because I went to. I spent three years under the guise of being a business, like business administration type type of a role. Um, I had always wanted to. Uh, be an entrepreneur, even as a pretty young child. Both of my parents had owned businesses growing up. And I think what happened was um, both of their businesses really came to an end as I was in school. And I think that seeing that happen, and I had seen both sides of that, of business ownership. And then I'd also seen the benefits of um, a career like an education field where while we do often work crazy hours, a lot of times that is by choice. And I felt like this type of a career would give me an opportunity to express myself. In a way, it's like being your own boss. Um, I draw a lot of parallels between being an entrepreneur and being an educator. Um, even though I may not be selling tangible items, it is this idea that I have control over my classroom. So a lot of this whole be your own boss kind of mentality, I feel, is very much built into it. Which is why I think a lot of teachers, um, veteran teachers right now are frustrated with being micromanaged through, you know, any various processes and why I think so many of them are turned off to things like PLC groups, which, by the way, I wholeheartedly support. I think that it is good to collaborate with your peers. I think that it is positive. You should know what the teacher across from you is doing in their class, especially if they're teaching the same thing. You should compare your data. Uh, but I understand why people who have been in this job for a long time um, are in a way, as they, I think the phrase is, they're teaching on an island. Um, it's, you know, once the classroom door closes, they're in control. Uh, but that's always been appealing to me. And I took a few introductory education classes. And through those classes, I was able to really kind of get a taste of what this job had to offer. And it just really stuck with me in a way that surprised me. Um, a year before getting into the program, it would not have even registered on my radar, being in education. Hmm. So. 
not exactly like informative to an audience necessarily to like make them a better teacher, but I still find it <laughs> yes. it's a good story. I, I, you did tell me a story to be fair. Like I asked you, you about a great teacher me. and I got you to tell me the story. <laughs> I so I, I'm going to say that that just proved the rule again, but <laughs> there you, go. you know, huh? It's interesting to me that it's funny because I've never asked you that before. I've never like asked you, you know, we worked together for a long time. I've never asked you that. And I, you have a passion for your kids and you have a drive to see them succeed. And I feel like, we put a stigma a lot of times on people that go into this profession because of the schedule or that go into it because mm-hmm. it seems like a safe job. And yet you came that path and still end up at a place where I know you're passionate about your students and you're now a leader, both technologically on campus, you're an instructional leader in this county, you know, you're, you're a lot of things that we would exemplify and yet you came the way that so many of us would look down upon. <laughs> Well, thank you for that <laughs> praise and for <laughs> praise and insult. It's pretty and, much how I yes, live my exactly. life. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, but you know, just just being perfectly honest, I mean, you know, there there are a lot of things that are attractive about an educational job. Salary, not necessarily being one of them, uh, but there are benefits to the job, and I think some of those benefits are important. I think uh, I was talking to somebody recently, and. They um, had noted how a teacher was complaining at the end of the break, like, oh, I have to go back to school. And their response was, well, yeah, but you just had two months off. And their response was, well, if you did my job every day for, you know, 10 months, um, (laughs) you'd understand why we need these two months. And of course, you know, the idea that every teacher goes in on this fabulous two month vacation globetrotting around the world is about as far from the truth as could be possible in most cases. Yeah, for many of us, it's you know, just transition to another type of work or um, whatever type of trainings that we have to attend. So there is definitely work to be done over the summer for most of us. Yes, I I do. I I almost feel bad for anyone who gets into the field thinking this is going to be great because I'm going to have weekends off and two months in the summer. And um, then they come to the realization that Half of that weekend was spent creating papers or creating content and a good portion or going to an event for the school. And a good portion of that summer was in trainings, which may or may not have been paid. (laughs) Yeah, we are. That is a rarity, I feel like, is paid summer training. And we are lucky in that sense. You know, wow, you just like have like totally derailed all my thought processes. (laughs) All right. Give me a technology best practice. What do you and actually. I'm going to point you in a direction because I, you told me something tonight that like totally blew my mind and it's <laughs> okay. such like a pro tip that I really want you to share that with me okay. again. Verbally. I think, I think I know where you're going with this pro tip. Um, so this pro tip <laughs> tonight's brought to you by, pro tip <laughs> exactly. brought to you by Michael Coleman. Yes. Um, so this pro tip revolves around a unique way to give a quiz using Google forms. Now, I think many individuals, especially if you're into technology and education, are familiar with Google's Forms platform and the idea that you can now easily convert a form into a quiz by toggling a little setting. Uh, But there is an extra opportunity to create a secure quiz that a lot of people are unfamiliar with in this. And there are a couple of things that you have to do in order to make this work. Um, First of all, your form has to have a minimum of two parts. And the way that I generally set it up is in part one of the form, that is where the students will put their name, student ID number, um, class period, any type of identifying information. And then the very last question, what you do is you simply create a quiz question. And in the bottom right hand corner, you will see the small little dot, dot, dot sign. When you click on this, Um, you'll get some options, and one of them is to create a regular expression. And you simply make sure that the expression matches a particular word. So in my case, I'll usually pick a term that we used in that particular unit of study, and I'll insert that word into that blank. And what this does is, unless the student knows the specific word that you've chosen, they cannot move on to part two. So what what you're doing is you're creating a roadblock that prevents them from actually accessing the test, which is in the second section of the quiz. This is, I'm realizing how hard it is to explain this over a podcast. I (laughs) I need a screencast of this. we'll We'll put some images in the show notes to go with this episode. But what I think is so cool about this is you've effectively hacked Google Forms to make it have an access code. And yet, so like when you were explaining to me, like what you do is you change it like pretty much right away. So you have an access code that you have, like, you say, okay, everybody put in your name and information, and then you say, okay, access code is this, 
and then they, you know, access code is late and they put in the word late and hit next. And now they have the questions in front of them. And then you can immediately go change that access code. So they only have like 30 seconds to get in. They don't even, they can't even text a friend and tell it to them that same period. Like it's just such a brilliant way to do this. And you can change the access code an unlimited number of times. So if a student walks in two minutes after you've started, you just simply generate it, you know, you type in a new term for them. Maybe you make it their name, you know, code is Bobby. Right now, go take your quiz, Bobby, and then you change it to whatever else you want for the next class periods. So it does help uh, because that's always a concern is, you know, what if they send, you know, this out? And I mean, I do get a little tired of hearing that complaint constantly. That's a very common complaint that I get is, well, now that we've gone digital, it's, you know, copying this, copying that. And, you know, I do try and explain to people that if you've set things up in a certain way, it makes it difficult for students to copy. So yeah, if you give them all the exact same worksheet, you're probably going to get a lot of copies that look pretty similar because the questions that you've asked only have one way to answer it. So if you're concerned about students copying, create content that requires the students to think and actually put their own expression of thought down. And I think you you hit on another one where you hit on another topic here where we're now we're talking about (laughs) content protection and and what is copying (laughs) and cheating, but you're right, and that is a constant complaint with my staff. So, first of all, before we move on, thank you for that pro tip. Like, I'm seriously, sure. like, mind blown. <laughs> I'm sending that out to my staff, like, tomorrow. Like, actually, I'll probably wait till Tuesday so I can put it in my Tech Tuesday. But <laughs> nice. I, like, I'm sending that out to my staff because I get that complaint all the time about access codes and opening the form. And so that's just such a great way to do it. But you talk about content protection. And that, do you do you feel like you often – I feel like I often deal with complaints about technology – that actually have nothing to do with technology. Always questions like, well, how do I do classroom management in a technology, you know, in a, in a computer class? Mm-hmm. How do I do, how do I prevent kids from cheating in a computer class? How do I, and so often I feel like my response is the same way you always have. Yeah. Are you monitoring your classroom? Are you, you know, you have to actively be engaged. You have to be walking around. Uh, and I think, you know, that is this, this idea that you're going to sit behind your desk and do everything remotely. Well, yeah, you know, if you're not actively circulating the room and you don't have eyes on the students, that's a problem. And, you know, I know that we have, we do have some amazing tools, some digital tools that can help us with that. So, you know, within our county, we've adopted Land School, which is fantastic. And, you know, the ability to see what's on a student's screen is invaluable in order to, you know, and that, that right within itself is a way to prevent a lot of, um, you know, copying and making sure that students are you know, lockdown or limited in access while testing. Typically, I have a pretty lengthy block list of sites, and I will enable that just prior to tests. Between that and access codes and walking around the room, I feel like it, it's extremely difficult for them to do that. But, you know, as I always tell teachers, if a kid's going to try and find a way to cheat, they're going to try and find a way. If it was a paper and pencil test, they're sneaking, you know, a picture of questions with their phone and sending it to somebody. And I don't know that that's any different than screen capturing, you know, something might be. So where there's a will, there's a way. (laughs) I think a lot of it comes down to, in my eyes, and, and you can tell me how you feel, but technology, no amount of technology is a replacement for teaching. I would certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to agree for our own personal benefit. Yes. I mean, you and I would probably still be safe because we'd be teaching the technology how to teach. So I think but, we uh, might be okay. But Between Amazon's Alexa and uh, <laughs> Google's home platform, I am definitely <laughs> concerned. <laughs> yes. AI is getting to a level where it definitely – it's funny because five years ago, I would say that there could never be a direct replacement for a teacher. But – it's really remarkable how far we've come. I think really what will ultimately prove our, our success as educators is that impact that we have in the classroom that just can't be replicated through technology. So you asking me the question earlier about an influential teacher, that's the kind of thing that a piece of technology can't do. It can't motivate students in the way that an individual in the classroom you know, has the capability to do. So we definitely have a very vital role to play. Well, you say that, but there's definitely an individual (laughs) piece of technology that I got in a classroom that led to my current lifestyle. So (laughs) that TI-86 changed my life, man. Oh, well, you know. (laughs) That's a little different. That's true. They handed me a thing that I could program on, and I never stopped. So there's – but you're right. There's still that teacher component of getting them involved and getting them there. You're right. So 
it's funny. It's funny that your argument for how technology won't replace us is something that doesn't even apply to you. Like, That's true. I don't never actually had an influential teacher, <laughs> yes. but I'm assuming that if you did, that would be <laughs> but good. If you did. Like that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's cool. We've had so many things, but I think the I think the overall concept is is you know the power of technology in a classroom and power and limitations maybe of technology in a classroom. And I think that you know given your skill set and my skill set and the time we spent together, that probably makes sense. That that's why we've done we've we've talked about that so much. And I feel like if you're listening to a podcast, you have a certain level of ability that regarding like technology. Yes, you at least <laughs> yeah. figured out how to hit. I don't subscribe. want to assume too much. However, <laughs> you at least figured yes. out how to hit subscribe. So yeah, that's something. You're ahead of the ahead of the bunch. Yeah. Any phenomenal technology you see revolutionizing technology? I mean, or revolutionizing teaching, I should say. You mentioned you mentioned Alexa and, and Home. Do you see AI being the next revolution in teaching? Do you see maybe VR being the next big thing? AR. Well, I see a lot of potentials for augmented reality, and there's another teacher in our district that's doing a phenomenal job, and they actually, at FETC, the Florida Educational Technology Conference, they've done some presentations that I've assisted with in AR, and I think that that field has a lot to explore. Some of the rumor mills regarding some new, um, both, both Apple and Android platforms that are looking to adopt some new capabilities and upcoming phones, um, I think could prove really exciting for classroom potential and use. Um, AR does have that ability to make these static objects and static pieces of text or items on a piece of paper really come to life. And I think that kids are actually, they've become to expect these types of experiences now. And that's the challenge is for us, this is some innovative new piece of technology, and to them, it's the logical progression. It's what they expect to see. To stay ahead of that curve or even just to, to match that is very challenging. Uh, but I do feel a lot of the lead technology component manufacturers are really doing good work and pushing those fields, and I'm very happy to see companies like Google and Microsoft and others putting such a focus in the field of education. And I think that's absolutely critical that they continue to value the educational markets. Have you had a chance to play with a HoloLens? I have, have ever not gotten, have you to wear one played yet? with one yet. No. They're so cool. They're I've used cool. almost every VR platform. I have not used the HoloLens, a HoloLens is, yet. It is super cool. I, I did get a chance to wear one. Tech College did a trip. That we, I chaperoned, and they had one set up, and I was like blown away. I like pushed kids out of the way. I was like, I don't care. This my I'm I'm an adult. I'm going to try this first. And, you know, to me, the appeal of the AR is just that you're still present. And I feel like that's important in a classroom. Um, I feel that the, and it's not that VR doesn't have any place in the classroom. I think you could have some really unique experiences, um, especially in a class like the one that I teach in a geography class, to be able to take students to a new place and completely immerse them in that environment, I think can have a very big impact on them. I also like to have that form of presence where they still know that they're in the classroom, but they're able to see these things. And for us to all interact and manipulate together, I think, is an important part of their growth. I feel like at some point we need to get to a technology that is simultaneously both. We need something that is selectively augmented or virtual. You know, there needs to be some level of, it can completely immerse you, but also can be make you present we need and that's i mean i guess that's probably the goal anyways right like i mean i'm sure there's plenty of people in cupertino and, and silicon valley and everywhere else that are in the m middle of Man, making yeah. those things that are trying really hard to make those things exist but i think that's probably the goal right where we could do both because they think both have a place um, i am excited about these future potentials and i will say that it is an exciting time to be in education and while I know that a lot of people have concerns over this particular present time with, you know, even just the transition of cell phones in the classroom was a big deal. And I remember going from kids not having phones to kids having phones and how revolutionary that was in both good and bad ways. It's interesting that you say we're in an exciting time in education when I think a lot of people would say the opposite. I think there's a lot of doom and gloom about where we're at right now. I know. And that makes me sad that that's how people feel about it. For me, every time a new tool becomes available, it's another opportunity to reach students, another way to immerse them in the learning process. And I'm very excited to see what's coming next. That's cool. I think, I think I'm with you. I think I'm, I'm right there with you. Like It's an exciting time. There's cool things happening. Uh, what's the next big thing you want to try? Well, beyond the HoloLens, <laughs> which, I would, love of course, to, the HoloLens. which I would love to try. 
As far as like new technology fields, you know, you had mentioned or we had had mentioned this idea of AI, and I think that that has the potential to be an even bigger breakthrough in the field of education. Um, something as a platform that can personalize a learning experience to a student that can give that kind of one-on-one -on -one direct feedback. Unfortunately, as budgets shrink in many districts, class sizes increase, and that limits the ability of the teacher to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And maybe there's the potential, you know, for AI to help fill in some of this gap. That would be that would be helpful, and I mean, we come back to that time aspect, right? Like maybe looking at AI not as a complete replacement, replacement, but as a as an assistant, you know, which is I Absolutely. think you talk about Alexa and you talk about Google Home, and that's why they're so successful. Is they are an assistant, they're not a replacement for anything in your house. They add, they make your life easier, they make it simpler. So yeah, I like that. I like that's a cool idea of like AI being an assistant for education. Yeah, if I the the more time that I can recoup from remedial tasks that could be replaced by AI, scanning and understanding, using a rubric that I've designed and identifying, you know, uh, work that students have done and helping to kind of give a suggested score, if you will, um, and allowing and, you know, kind of cluing me in, maybe like pinpointing parts in an essay that, you know, would draw a teacher's attention. If it can speed up that process, that frees me up to create better, richer content in the classroom. Yeah, I like that. That's awesome. You know, we're coming up to a close here. We're going to wrap this thing up. So do you have any final thoughts for the audience as they're listening to our episode? Uh, what, do you, what are you thinking, closing it out? To me, the takeaway would be, you know, don't be afraid to try new things. Embrace, embrace a lot of these new technology platforms that are available, but don't try and do it all. You know, if every piece of technology has a potential use case scenario and it either works for you or it doesn't. For one teacher, it might be the greatest thing ever, um, and it just simply isn't going to work within your routine. So, uh, But don't be afraid to try these new things. Cool. I think that's perfect. I think we'll leave them with that. So, Mike, thank you for sitting with me. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you taking your time tonight after we've already had a very long day of <laughs> daytime teaching, then yes, nighttime this teaching. This has been and, so. a 14-hour day Yeah, nice of, one. of fun. Nice but one. I want to thank you for having me on. Yeah, it was absolutely. a real pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike. And that was it, my interview with Michael Coleman. I hope you guys got something out of it, maybe a tech tip you liked or something you might want to see coming in the future. If you did, go ahead and let me know on Twitter. Say, hey, I liked what Mike said about such and such, and I'll be glad to pass that feedback on along to him. I really would appreciate that. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to see implemented technology-wise in a classroom or any other new technology you think could be pushing education forward, let me know about that too. Until next time, we'll be back again in two weeks with another interview for you. I think I got something special for you in a couple weeks, and I hope you're going to like it. Something a little different. But until that time, we'll see you in two weeks. As always, thank you to the amazingly talented Kevin McLeod for his creation of Vicious, which is our intro and closing music you're listening to behind me right now. And thank you to all of our other supporters, and have a good night. Or day. I guess you're not necessarily watching this during the night. It doesn't really matter. All right. See you guys.